Hello, my friends, and welcome back to another Our Turtle House Digital Fireside. My name is Mark Williams. I'm your host, and it's so good to be back with you for another Fireside this evening. We've got some wonderful speakers. I'll introduce individually right before they speak. We're going to go th do things a little bit differently today. And so I'm so excited to, to share with you tonight's Fireside as we talk about the magic of new beginnings. And the reason why this is such a cool topic, I think, is that you know, whether you are going back to school or it's right around that time where, where school's starting again or you're, you're going to a new grade or maybe as an adult, you're starting a new job or, or you want to learn something new, a new hobby. The beauty, the magic of new beginnings is that we all have them. And it doesn't matter how old we are or how young we are. We're all going to go through learning new things and having new experiences. And so how can we go through and, and actually, hopefully, enjoy those new experiences and not be driven crazy by them. So our speakers tonight are going to bring some wonderful perspective and stories, personal examples, as they share with, with all of us about how we can bring more magic to the new beginnings that we have in our life. Whatever age we, we may be or whatever experiences those new beginnings or new starts or, or whatever it may be, is in our life. <laughs> so thank you so much again for being with us. We'll start off with an opening prayer. I'll give that and then we'll move in with our speakers. We'll move in and start hearing from our speakers. Our dear only Father, we're grateful for this day and for the many blessings that we have received from thee and for the opportunity that we have to be with each other for this fireside and the technology that brings us all together. We are grateful for each of our speakers and for the time and commitment that they have provided to prepare these messages, these inspirational messages, and ask that thy blessing will be upon all of them, that the messages that they share will be impactful and valuable to, to those who are listening today, as well as throughout the future. We're grateful for all that thou hast given us, and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, let's welcome our first speaker who studied nursing and taught nursing students for several years. She's served as a missionary at BYU, as well as a full-time mission through in Taiwan, Hong Kong, the Philippines, and Indonesia. She directed a health project for children in Nigeria, West Africa, was the director of training at the MTC in Provo, and served as a member of the Relief Society General Board for 11 years. She's authored several books and recorded talks as well. Her hobbies and interests do not currently include cooking, sewing, landscaping, fixing small appliances, yodeling, babysitting, rock climbing, or skydiving, but she does love to do all of her own stunts. She enjoys her family and friends, teaching, writing, music, people, reading, thinking, serving, and being a happier human. She loves, uh, she is in a different time zone than any, everyone else, where she lives in Midway, and <laughs> and also just kind of has a, an interesting uh, times when she's awake and everything, she finds herself asleep between 3 and 4 p.m. and then gets up around midnight or so. And so she loves the early mornings. And so let's welcome our first speaker, Mary Ellen Edmonds. Mary Ellen, it's so good to have you with us. So let's go ahead. I can't wait to hear your thoughts on how we can bring the magic to new beginnings. So go ahead and take it away, my friend. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be with you. And I hope it all works really, really well. You've probably noticed, as I have, that life is filled with new things. Some we likely don't remember, like when we first were born. And I think that's why babies cry. It's just a real adjustment. Very, very new. And maybe it's the reason why they don't talk either, or they could really uh, entertain us. Anyway, we face many new things in our lives. Learning to walk so we can get around without crawling everywhere learning to talk so we can make our needs known, ask questions. My mother had a stroke when she was a bit younger than I am now. She was only in her 70s, and she had to learn to talk again. <clears throat> Sometimes that was very amusing to us, not to her. Our first day at school is likely to be somewhat traumatic, more for our mothers than for us. It takes time to get adjusted and accustomed to new things. When I first went to kindergarten, we went out for recess. I'd never done that before, but uh, when it was finished, I just walked home. I thought we were through for the day. 
through all of the grades, my best friend and I would always look at the signs that were on the doors of the teacher's classroom to see if we could be together. We managed that a few times. It just made it not quite so new if I could be with my best friend. There are likely things that we once learned, things that may be very important that we have forgotten. Maybe we all need to go back to school together. Sometimes in our lives, we move to a new place. This happened to me when I was about 17. We left my wonderful hometown of Cedar City and moved north to Mapleton. And that was a tough adjustment, especially uh, I went to school in Provo, BY High. And it was, it was just kind of a hard beginning. But with the wonderful friends in that school, it ended up being a very, very good year. Some of us have had adjustments as we've had new teachers. We got used to the teacher we just had, and now we have a new teacher and we've got to get adjusted to her or him. I remember going on my first mission. I was 22, almost exactly 60 years ago this month. <laughs> wow. I was sent to Taiwan, which is in the news a lot lately. I love Taiwan, I pray for them. But almost everything was new, including the food, yes, but also including the language. As I studied Mandarin, which has tones, that means if you say the wrong tone, you say the wrong word, and our companions helped us, I remember when I was learning, I would bob my head. <laughs> kind of like a musical instrument, my head. But the first long thing that our companion would teach us was to tell the experience that Joseph Smith had. And we would ride our bikes out to the edge of, a, of our town and practice and practice. And one day she said, you're ready when it's time for the Joseph Smith experience. It's your turn. I didn't want to be ready. It was hard not to pray that nobody would be home or they wouldn't let us in if they were home. But finally, we were in the home of a Mrs. Leem sitting on the floor, as was the custom, a lot of customs from Japan. And my companion began to teach. And then she paused and looked over at me, and I knew it was time. The feeling that came to me at that moment was, all you can do is the best you can do. And so I did the best I could do with my with my little noises, probably with my head bobbing. That was Joseph Smith. They say the last name first. Something incredible happened. The Holy Ghost took my noises over to Mrs. Lean, and a boy went into a grove of trees and prayed, and the father and the son appeared to him. That was an incredible thing in my whole life, not just on that particular mission. I testify that the gift of the Holy Ghost is a wonderful blessing in our lives. Uh, I remember the blessing of a brother Ocampo in the Philippines who wanted to know how to pray. He had been praying his whole life, some memorized prayers that he learned. But we taught him that he could talk to his heavenly father. And I'll never forget the first time he was ready to do that. He asked a few more questions. And then he suggested we all kneel down. We had to get permission to do that as missionaries and not just expect they'd uh, let us do it, that it, they would appreciate it. We knelt down together. He waited almost a whole minute. Later when my companion and I talked about it, we decided that this was, yes, something new, but one of the most beautiful things in his life thus far. He was about to speak to his heavenly father from his heart for the first time. 
he had told us he would pray in English. He knew a little bit so that we could correct him if he would do anything wrong. He wasn't about to do anything wrong. So he'd pray a little bit and then sisters. Yes. If I am slow, will he wait for me? Yes. Then he'd try a little bit more. Sisters. Yes. I can say anything I want. Oh, yes, anything. A little bit more. Sisters, yes. This is very beautiful, no? Oh, this is very beautiful, Brother Ocampo. A little tiny bit more. And then, sisters, yes. Does he know Tagalog? Oh, yes, he knows Tagalog. And then he poured out his soul to his heavenly father. I remember wishing I understood enough Tagalog to know what he was saying. And I got a little message from heaven saying, he's not praying to you. Don't worry about it. I'm so thankful for the experiences I've had. Life is full of new things. In, uh, in 82 years, I have run across many new things from learning to walk, to learning to talk, to learning to drive, to learning to ride a bicycle. <laughs> it is a blessing to receive heavenly help. My life has been filled with heavenly help. Yours likely has been too. And I encourage you to thank Heavenly Father for the wonderful blessings that have come when you've needed them and when it's been the right time for you to receive them. I'm glad I could be with you today. I'm a very slow turtle, but I close my little message in the holy name of our Heavenly Father's beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Mary Ellen, thank you so much for your message tonight. That was fantastic. It's always so inspiring hearing you speak. So thank you so much again for being with us on the fireside. Let's introduce our second speaker of the evening who says that he's the he's blessed to be the husband to the most amazing woman in the world. And he's also the father of the four most remarkable and wonderful children in the world as well, he says. He served as a full-time missionary in the Philippines from 2010 to 2012 and is currently completing his doctoral thesis as a PhD candidate at Western University in Canada and studying and is studying exercise physiology nutrition. He completed his master's degree in the same field and his bachelor's degree in honors kinesiology. And something cool about him is that he can dunk a basketball. How cool is that? Let's welcome our next speaker, Reed Zare. Reed, it's so good to have you here with us on the fireside. Thank you so much for being with us. And uh, I'm just impressed, man, that you can you can dunk a basketball. I'm insanely jealous. <laughs> so, yeah, what can I say? <laughs> uh, just just out of curiosity, how tall are you? Um, I'm almost six foot seven, so I round up to six seven. Okay, okay. <laughs> I guess that's a pretty good reason to be able yeah, to, to dunk. I have no so. excuse. So <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, Reed, thank you so much for being with us, and so excited to hear your thoughts on how we can create or experience the magic of new beginnings. So go ahead and take it away, my friend. Awesome. Well, firstly, thank you again for inviting me uh, to share a few thoughts. Um, and as sincerely as I can say, I, I do consider this a real privilege. Um, one of my favorite scriptures in the Book of Mormon is found in Alma chapter 34, verse 9. And it says, For it is expedient that an atonement should be made. For according to the great plan of the eternal God, there must be an atonement made or else all mankind must unavoidably perish. Yea, all are hardened, yea, all are fallen and are lost, and must perish except it be through the atonement, which it is expedient should be made. This particular scripture directly references the atonement of Jesus Christ three times. There is no other scripture in existence that directly mentions the atonement of Jesus Christ this many times. In fact, throughout the entire New Testament, there is only one direct reference to the atonement of Jesus Christ. That scripture is found in Romans chapter 5, verse 11. With only one verse in the Book of Mormon, we have increased the direct references threefold. There is no other book of scripture on the planet that teaches the doctrine of the atonement of Jesus Christ in greater detail and depth than the Book of Mormon. 
The Book of Mormon is indeed Jesus Christ's book. The concepts of starting new, starting over, and getting a fresh start would be just nice ideas without the atonement of Jesus Christ. I testify to all my brothers and sisters listening to me today that the atonement of Jesus Christ is a reality. Jesus Christ did in fact walk this earth, the earth he created. He lived the most difficult life that has ever been lived or ever will be lived on this earth. He paid in full our extraordinary debt to justice, the price for every person's sins. He is my redeemer and he is your redeemer. I know he is alive today. It is because of his atonement we all have the privilege to change, repent, and start new. In October 1989, President Ezra Taft Benson taught, quote, We must be careful as we seek to become more and more godlike, that we do not become discouraged and lose hope. Hope is an anchor to the souls of men. Satan would have us cast away that anchor. In this way, he can bring discouragement and surrender, but we must not lose hope. The Lord is pleased with every effort, even the tiny daily ones in which we strive to be more like him. Though we may see that we have far to go on the road to perfection, we must not give up hope." End quote. In the Old Testament, in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 18, verses 2 through 6, we read, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. For those who don't know, marred means to be blemished or damaged. In this passage, the Lord Jesus Christ likened himself to a potter who has all skill to overcome any blemish or damage. Jesus Christ can change any of us. All of us can start new. In May 2007, Elder David A. Bednar taught, quote, Spiritual rebirth typically does not occur quickly or all at once. It is an ongoing process, not a single event. Line upon line and precept upon precept, Gradually and almost imperceptibly, our motives, our thoughts, our words, and our deeds become aligned with the will of God. This phase of the transformation process requires time, persistence, and patience. Our souls need to be continuously immersed in and saturated with the truth and the light of the Savior's gospel. Sporadic and shallow dipping in the doctrine of Christ and partial participation in his restored church cannot produce the spiritual transformation that enables us to walk in a newness of life. Rather, fidelity to covenants, constancy of commitment, and offering our whole soul unto God are required if we are to receive the blessings of eternity." End quote. In addition to Elder Bednar's teachings, in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, we read, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross daily, and follow me. From the mouth of our Savior Jesus Christ himself, he taught that the spiritual transformation process to become like him requires daily effort. Furthermore, in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 93, verses 12 and 13, we read, And I, John, saw that he received not of the fullness at the first, but received grace for grace. And he received not of the fullness at first, but continued from grace to grace until he received the fullness. Even our Redeemer, Jesus Christ himself, grew from grace to grace. How can we expect the rate of our transformations to be any different? Ether 12.27 is a popular and well-known scripture throughout the church. I wonder, though, if the level of understanding of the doctrine found in this verse matches the high level of recognition that it carries. This scripture says, And if men come unto me, I will show unto them their weakness. I give unto men weakness, that they may be humble. And my grace is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me. For if they humble themselves before me and have faith in me, then will I make weak things become strong unto them. I feel it is worthwhile to break the scripture down into smaller, more manageable segments to better appreciate the supreme significance found therein. Section 1. And if men come unto me, I will show unto them their weakness. As we come unto Jesus Christ, he shows us our weaknesses. As taught in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, we learn that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. How can we improve 
and better aspects of our lives if we are not even aware of the areas that need improving. Jesus Christ lovingly shows us our weaknesses. Section 2. I give unto men weakness that they may be humble. Jesus Christ gave us weaknesses. This was done out of love. Weaknesses are truly opportunities to rely on the Lord Jesus Christ and his atonement. This concept matches well with Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, which says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The reality is that all of us are totally and entirely dependent upon the power of the atonement of Jesus Christ. Section 3. And my grace is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, we read, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. In October 2021, Elder Brent H. Nielsen taught an exemplary lesson regarding the Savior's miraculous feeding of the 5,000. Following the feeding, Jesus Christ asked his disciples to collect all the remaining food, which happened to fill 12 baskets. Elder Nielsen taught, quote, I have wondered why the Savior took the time to do that. It has become clear to me that one lesson we can learn from that occasion was this. He could feed 5,000 and there were leftovers. The Savior's redeeming and healing power can cover any sin, wound, or trial, no matter how large or how difficult, and there are leftovers. His grace is sufficient, end quote. Section 4. For if they humble themselves before me and have faith in me, then will I make weak things become strong unto them. Jesus Christ makes weak things become strong, not us. As the Lord Jesus Christ taught in John chapter 15, verses 4 and 5, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. We, on our own, do not have the power to repent, to change, and become like Jesus Christ. We need the power of the atonement of Jesus Christ. In April 2014, Professor of Church History and Doctrine Lloyd D. Newell taught, quote, When John the Baptist was preaching in the wilderness, preparing the hearts of the people to receive the Messiah, he quoted this passage from the writings of Isaiah. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be made smooth. Why did he quote this passage? What do valleys and mountains have to do with the Savior's impending ministry and atonement? It seems unlikely that John was talking only about geography or topography. Perhaps these metaphors tell us more about Jesus' mission than we might realize. It is as if John were saying, change is coming. Think of something that seems permanent to you, like a mountain. That mountain can be flattened. That's the degree of change that is possible through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are there things in your life that seem insurmountable? They can be overcome. Does your life seem rough or unstable? Through the atonement of Jesus Christ, all of that can be made smooth. Anything can change. You can change. End quote. In closing, I would like to share a short story known as The Man in the Cabin. A man was sleeping at night in his cabin when suddenly his room filled with light and the Savior appeared. The Lord told the man he had a work for him to do and showed him a large rock in front of his cabin. The Lord explained that the man was to push against the rock with all his might. This the man did day after day. For many years he toiled from sun up to sundown his shoulders squarely against the cold, massive surface of the unmoving rock, pushing with all his might. Each night, the man returned to his cabin, sore and worn out, feeling that his whole day had been spent in vain. Seeing that the man was showing signs of discouragement, the adversary decided to enter the picture by placing thoughts into the man's mind. You have been pushing against that rock for a long time, and it hasn't moved. Why kill yourself over this? You are never going to move it. The man began to believe that the task was impossible and that he was a failure, and he felt discouraged and disheartened. Why kill myself over this, he thought. I'll just put in my time, giving just the minimum effort, and that'll be good enough. 
and he planned to do that until one day he decided to make it a matter of prayer and take his troubled thoughts to the Lord. Lord, he said, I've pushed long and hard against this rock in your service, putting all my strength to do that which you have asked. Yet after all this time, I have not even moved that rock one little bit. What is wrong? Why am I failing? Jesus responded compassionately, My friend, when I asked you to serve me and you accepted, I told you that your task was to push against the rock with all your strength, which you have done. Not once did I mention to you that I expected you to move it. Your task was to push. And now you come to me with your strength gone, thinking you have failed. But is that really so? Look at yourself. Your arms are strong and muscled. Your back is strong and tanned. Your hands are calloused and hardened from constant pressure, and your legs are strong and are more muscular than before. Through opposition, you have grown much, and your abilities now surpass that which you used to have. Yet, you haven't moved the rock. Your calling was to be obedient and to push and to exercise your faith and trust in my wisdom. This you have done. I, my friend, will now move the rock. I testify that Jesus Christ lives. I know he is real. I know he has all power in heaven and on earth. I know he can move any rock in any of our lives. Trust in him. Exercise your faith in him, however small and insignificant it may seem to be. Through this exercise of faith, he moves the rocks in our lives. Bind and yoke yourselves to him through his holy priesthood ordinances and covenants. He is the author and finisher of our faith. In the sacred name of Jesus Christ, amen. Reed, thank you so much for your message. That was so inspiring. And I love the, the change of perspective that you helped me have where it, it makes me think of the parable that you told at the end of your talk. It makes me think kind of like karate kids where Daniel said, he is doing all this housework or yard work or just work, washing the car, wax on, wax off, and, or, or uh, you know, painting a fence or, or all this, these different chores that he thinks are just chores, but come to find out that they were preparing him for something more. And uh, I think that sometimes, especially when we're trying new things, that it's like that. The hard things that we go through, even if it doesn't turn out the way that we think, it can be preparing us for something more, something greater, something that we'll be able to use collectively in the future. And so thank you so much. That was such a cool message. I really appreciate it. And, and thank you again for being here on the fireside with us tonight. Let's move to our final speaker, who's no stranger to these firesides, a dear friend. He's a speaker, podcaster, and coach who focuses on the fun side of habits, not just any habits, though, the habits that make you happier. He currently lives in Cuna, Idaho with his wife and seven children. He runs, reads, and podcasts, but most often you'll find him at the baseball or softball field, the swimming pool, the basketball court, the dance studio, a piano or choir recital, or the soccer pitch. And uh, just a little fun fact about him is that he started the first positive Book of Mormon podcast. He's done over a thousand podcast episodes, and just recently he spoke at the last uh, or no, he spoke at the last ever traditional EFY and just recently spoke at FSY this summer with John, by the way. So let's welcome our dear friend, Jason Harwood. Jason, so good to have you back, my friend. It's always good being with you. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Good to be here. It, it, I will say that there was a, a moment about five to 10 minutes before every class started at that particular FSY where somebody had to be assigned to stand outside of Brother, by the way, is room and say, sorry, this class is full. You'll have to attend one of the other two classes. But uh, I love it. it. Was, it I mean, gosh, uh, talk about just this surreal experience as a kid growing up, uh, listening to and loving uh, John, by the way, and then having a chance to teach with him. It was incredible. So how yeah. cool. We love John. He's just got such a cool perspective on the gospel. So, yeah. Yeah. But. My friend, so so grateful that you're here as we talk about the magic of new beginnings, starting school, you know, starting the new year. I mean, I know that that's not for a few more months, but but just, you know, we, we're always starting new things. And so, yeah. so excited to hear your perspective on new beginnings and how we can make that whole process a bit 
better, a bit easier, a bit more fun. You know? Yeah. So yeah. Go ahead and take it away, my friend. Thank you. Well, it is fun because I have so many children and I have two kids who are going to be seniors this upcoming school year. And uh, I feel like it's like light because my oldest son is on a mission currently serving in Hawaii. That's why I'm wearing my fancy uh, pineapple tie in honor of him. So I only have six kids at home, but two of them will be seniors. And I recently had an interesting conversation with my daughter who's about to be a senior. And I'm going to share with you the list of some of the things that she has going on in her life. And I need your help on identifying what she should eliminate from her life because she's had a really rough time the last few days feeling overwhelmed with everything that she has going on and and see if you could come up with maybe a similar list because for her she currently is about to start all of the schoolwork of her senior year that she knows she needs to do she's also involved in church and of course with her young women's group she's trying to earn some money and work a little bit on the side she loves to swim, and this will be her fourth year as a swimmer for our high school swim team. She also, just this year, decided, never done it before, but I'm going to join the cheer squad. So she is now a cheerleader, along with her younger sister. I have two daughters who this year, out of the blue, just said, you know what, Dad, we want to do cheer. I said, okay. She's incredibly crafty and skilled, and so she's creating a bunch of stuff with this cricket machine that she has and creating rings that say words on them. And she wants to start an Etsy shop. She's also in choir, but she's not just uh, singing in the choir. She also has a leadership position in the choir. And as you can see, that only takes up half the screen of slide because on top of that, she has her senior project that she needs to do, worry about college admission. She's got friends, her physical health, her mental health, her spiritual health, her family activities. And of course, she has chores. Oh, my word. So much going on. Does that maybe does that screen feel like your life? And so as we talk about new beginnings and starting new things, man, sometimes we look around and think, you know, instead of what should I start, it's what should I eliminate? And I had that conversation with her recently of saying, what are the things on this list that maybe you need to consider removing from your life? Now, as we went through each of these things, uh, one came up and that was cheer. And I want to share with you her response to the concept of cheer, because I'm going to touch on this later. She says, we've already paid a lot of money to do cheer. I can't quit now. But as we went through this list of things and we talked about, okay, what should you do? What, how can you decide which things to do? That's really the challenge. Um, you know, one of my favorite lines in all of Disney movies is the first spoken line in the song from the Lion King. There's far too much to take in. There's more to life than can ever be done, more to see than can ever be seen. And so it's not a question of, you know, wh what should I do? We're overwhelmed with possibilities, in fact, of what we could do. The question really comes down to where are we going to spend our time? Where are we going to spend our focus? And so I talked with her and I said, you know, you've got all of these decisions to make. And there's a lot of factors that go into these decisions. Things like, yeah, how much money does it cost? That does play an issue. How much time does it take up? And, and those are two finite resources, money and time. And so every decision you know, is influenced by those things. And then there's also all sorts of pressures, social pressure, family pressure, um, you know, kind of maybe some cultural pressure around some of the things that she should be doing. Now, the challenge is, is that all of these pressure, all of these factors are outside in pressures on, on your decision making. They, they come from the surrounding area and push in as we're trying to make decisions. And you feel a lot of pressure from how much money should I spend? How much time is this going to take? What are the social, emotional, family friend, societal pressures pushing down on me. But this is not an effective 
pattern, an effective method for making decisions. Because when we operate on this type of pattern or methodology for making decisions, we are being influenced from the outside in. Instead, what we want to do is look at a couple of scriptures that teach us about a better pattern for making decisions. We'll start in the New Testament, Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. This idea that there's good that we can do in the world and that God hath before ordained. There's another word that we could use for this. This is in Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to put them who are, who are the called according to his purpose. So in Ephesians, Paul uses the word that he hath before ordained them. In Romans, it's talking about God's purpose. Second Nephi 2.25. A favorite scripture, if you're ever called on to do a scripture, uh, because you could do a quick scripture thought on this one. Um, Adam felt that men might be, and men are, that they might have joy. You see God's purpose in that verse. What was ordained? The good works and the joy. What is God's purpose? We know from Moses 139, his uh, work and glory is to bring to pass immortality and eternal life of men. And so you see this better pattern of starting with good work, starting with purpose, starting with this mission statement, starting with the things that are his work and glory. Doctrine and Covenants, three. The works, the designs, the purpose. There's that word again. Purposes of God cannot be frustrated. God doth not work, walk in crooked paths. Uh, and there at the end, therefore, his paths are straight. His course is one eternal round. This is uh, in Doctrine and Covenant section three. What's going on in church history is the loss of the 116 manuscript pages. And God saying, hey, you know what, Joseph? It's okay. I had a purpose in place. I had a plan in place. My purposes, my designs, my works cannot be frustrated. Uh, that's why Joseph Smith later, his famous quote, no unhallowed hand can stop the work of God from progressing. The purposes of God will go forward until it has visited every clime, etc. The purposes of God. And so while we might look at a pattern of looking at money, time, pressure, these outside influences in making our decision, the pattern and the process that God has outlined through his through some examples in, in his holy word, is that we start with purpose and values. We don't work from the outside in of outside pressure coming in to influence what we do and how we spend our time. No, we start from a place of purpose and value and work outward. Oops, I went the wrong way. Work outward to decisions. Decisions aren't the inside being influenced no, decisions are the outside. It's, it's what we do with our purpose and values. It's the good works that we accomplish as an outward expression of our inward commitment, our inward desire, our inward purpose. So as we're deciding what to do, and as I went through that list with my daughter, it wasn't how much money does it take? How much time does it take? How much pressure is there? How much social pressure? Are your friends involved in this? Um, you know, do you feel like there's some type of external reasoning why you should do this? What I told her was that I actually couldn't really give her exact advice on which one of those things to eliminate. So what I told her to do was to start making a list of what's most important to her. What is her driving purpose in her life right now? What are her core values? What are the things that bring you joy, fulfillment, and a sense of purpose? Find common characteristics around what brings you happiness, joy, and purpose, and what are your core values? Because then it becomes very easy. Then when a decision comes at you, you don't think, uh, you know, 
about the time, the money, or the pressure, you think, does this align with my core values? Um, and so as the example of cheerleading came up that I told you about, it, her response to this was interesting. Oh, I can't stop cheerleading. We've already paid a bunch of money for it. This is what we call the sunk cost fallacy, which is that once I've invested money or time or effort or emotional um currency into a particular thing, I'm very hesitant to stop. It's sunk cost. I don't want to lose the cost of what I've put in. I don't want to lose the value of what I've already put in. Now, this is, it's called a fallacy because it's not true. In fact, the reality is, is that if you are have put time, effort, energy, and emotional currency into something that is out of alignment, and that's the thing. Is it out of alignment with your purpose and values? If you have put time, effort, energy, money, whatever, into things and they are out of alignment, the most important thing you can do is to stop faster. Stop as fast as possible. Because the only thing worse than putting some time, effort, energy, money, emotional currency into something that's out of alignment is to put more time, effort, energy, and uh, emotional currency into something that is out of alignment. Now, she hasn't decided whether or not she's going to stop cheerleading. I just use that as the example because of her response. I can't stop it because we've already paid money into it. Sunk cost fallacy. Don't make a decision around whether you're going to continue doing something based off of how much you've already put in. Make the decision around whether or not it's in alignment with your purpose and values. And if it's not, stop as fast as possible. Eliminate it quicker. Because if you're just throwing money down a hole, the worst thing you can do is throw more money down a hole. If you're just putting time and effort into something that's out of alignment, it's bad that you've put time and energy into something that's out of alignment. It's worse to keep going. So stop as fast as possible. For me personally, I'm always struck by James Clear, the author of Atomic Habits, because I podcast and, and speak and uh, my Instagram is all about habits and creating successful habits. Uh, my, my little podcast is called the uh, Happily Ever Habits podcast. And, and so I love James Clear. He's somebody I aspire to. And if you've read his book, he starts off his story about as a senior in high school at a baseball practice, he was tragically hit in the face with a baseball bat and was in fact in a coma for a number of uh, days for a period of time. And that coming out of that experience, he learned these practices of habits and implementing these practices of habits helped him to eventually become a successful college baseball player as well as helped him in other aspects of his life. But because I podcast and speak on habits, it would be a bit out of alignment to say, well, gosh, the way that James Clear really propelled his success was by getting hit in the face with a baseball bat. So clearly, the way I would need to propel my habit conversation forward is to follow that example. And I have a son who was a high school baseball player and, and I could arrange it. He's also a weightlifter and won a bodybuilding competition. And that would be a terrible combination. But sometimes we do that. Sometimes we look to others and say, well, they're doing this. So I must have to do it too. James Clear is successful talking about habits. I want to be successful talking about habits. He got hit in the face with a baseball bat. I don't have to get hit in the face with a baseball bat because that doesn't always align with maybe your purpose, your vision, your mission. You've got to identify not what other people are doing, but what's your core. Another good example of this is Something crazy you can do if you want to. Go on TikTok and just search for 5 a.m. I did this just before coming on this um, broadcast. And uh, you'll see some really incredible little TikTok videos about things that people do at 5 a.m. 
But just because somebody else is doing something at 5 a.m. doesn't mean you have to do it. You, if you tried to go into TikTok and search for 5 a.m. and look at all the things that other people are doing and say, I have to do all of those, well, you'd, you'd spend all day long trying to do the things that people do at 5 a.m. It's ridiculous. Fascinating that some of the TikToks are about people who are still awake at 5 a.m. and some of them are about people who are just getting up at 5 a.m. So half the time you think I got to stay up until 5 and half the time you think I have to get up at 5 and both of those would be wrong if they were out of alignment with your purpose and values. Just like it's clearly silly for me to think I have to get hit in the face with a baseball bat. Now, the question is not, should I do it? Should my daughter do cheer? Should she do choir? Should she do swimming? Should she do a job? Should she do her Etsy shop? Right? It, that's not the question. And we have to stop posing the question, should I do this? As you're looking at new beginnings, as you're looking at new things in your life, I want to invite you to stop asking the question, should I do it? That's not the question. The question is, does it align? If we go back to those scriptures, you don't see a lot of question around, should God do this? No, the question is, is it in alignment with God's purpose? Is it in alignment with the um, what God knew before? Is it in alignment with the good works that are aligned with God's purpose? Same thing for you. If you want to start using the same methodology around decision-making that we learn from the scriptures, you move from, should I do it, to, does it align? Now, for me personally, I had this remarkable experience of sitting in the stake president's office the day my son was set apart to be a missionary, and the stake president had us read Doctrine and Covenant section 4, verse 6. Faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, brotherly kindness, godliness, charity, humility, diligence. And I had this overwhelming sense that those for me, are core values I needed to focus on. And ever since that time, I have spent a significant amount of time. I went and got a brand new set of scriptures so I could study these words. I've spent time in, in trying to develop habits, trying to develop consistent behaviors, trying to more consistently bring into my life the, the virtues of charity, humility, diligence, brotherly kindness, temperance, patience, because those are the core values I want at my core so that my decisions emanate from that. And I can make decisions based off of core values, not decisions based off of outside influences coming in on me. And so as a, a opportunity, as a decision, as a uh, a way to spend my time comes up, I often think, does it promote faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, brotherly kindness, temperance, uh, patience, godliness, charity, humility, diligence, out of order, but you get the point. Now, real quick, when you decide what your core values are and you think, okay, I want to start something new, I did give another Turtle House presentation about these three core concepts, and you can, uh, I, I talk about them all the time on my podcast and things, but habit key number one, start small. Uh, the go big or go home mentality will often leave you frustrated. So just start small. When I wanted to learn more, for example, knowledge, it was read one page every single day. Read one page every day. I can do that. Read one page every day. Start small. Number two, make it easy. Tie it to an existing habit. That's the easiest way to make a new habit easy. So find something you're already doing, like brushing your teeth. You already brush your teeth every day. So every day after brushing your teeth, read your one page. Every day after brushing your teeth, um, say a kind word to yourself in the mirror. Improve your, your uh, inner uh, mental health. Uh, every day, immediately after dinner, do so, right? You, so make it easy by tying it to an existing habit and then celebrate your small wins. When I read my one page a day, I put my bookmark in, I set my book down and I go, hey, I did it. I did it. It's small, but... It's something that matters, and it's a decision coming from my inner core. I'm so proud of myself for making a decision of how to spend my time based off of my core values. So as you're thinking about new things, as you're thinking about new beginnings, my encouragement to you is to spend some time now. We've heard some incredible insights on, um, on what matters most. 
today in our fireside. And so I encourage you to spend some time prayer, scripture study. It's, it's not a five minute activity, but it can be done in five minute chunks of just identifying what are the things that bring you happiness? How are you fulfilled? What are the things that add a uh, purpose to your life? And then add, make your own core statement. What's your purpose? What are the values that are going to drive your decisions? And it will make your decision making much easier around what new exciting things you want to do in your life. And you'll come better in alignment with the pattern that God shows us in the scriptures. Share that invitation with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Wasn't that an amazing fireside? I always love hearing from Mary Ellen and Jason. And this was the first time that we've had uh, read on the fireside, but it's always good to, it, it was fantastic learning and hearing from him as well. So wherever you are throughout the world, thank you so much for being with us tonight. We hope this message finds you well, and we'll catch you next week for another digital fireside. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.